Welcome. Welcome to Global Outlook Norway, brought to you by the University of Agder, GCE Norde, GARD, and IDA Cluster. Today's theme is conflict or cooperation in the 2020s. This, of course, depends on how the relations between the United States and China develops. It matters because it's going to impact us all. My name is Anita, and I'm today's moderator. Eras have names. So once upon a time, it was BC before Christ, then it was AD after death, and now it is AC after Corona. Except the Corona is still with us. This tiny little virus has disrupted everyone everywhere. So in BC, as in before Corona, Global Outlook, which was attended by more than 600 people, was part of Arndals Uka, which of course has been unfortunately canceled because of the pandemic. But we are, our sponsors, the sponsors of Global Outlook were determined to go ahead with it. And so, despite all the difficulties, here we are on schedule August 10th to hold Global Outlook 2020. This is a hybrid version. So we have about 100 physical and socially distanced guests in two rooms here. And then we have several hundred joining us online. Um, our keynote speakers will be joining us from Oslo, Brussels, Washington, Singapore, and London. Um, and after the keynote speeches, we will be having questions and answers. So those who want to uh, ask the questions, please come to the microphone over here. Or otherwise, uh, those who are online, please uh, text us your questions. I would also like to introduce to you Helena Fladmark of Ida Cluster, a big champion of Global Outlook. Helena? Here we are uh, welcoming you also from uh, the other room uh, here at the uh, Fevik Stan Hotel. We have uh, two live audiences here today. Uh, and as Anita mentioned, we will have some interaction also from this room. So here we are. But uh, now let's start. Uh, I'm so happy to let Anita lead us through the day. The floor is yours, Anita. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. The coronavirus has taught us many things. We know we don't know much. We also know that in addition to the new problems, existing problems are aggravated or highlighted. It is extraordinary that there was no coordinated US-led international action to tackle the pandemic. A pandemic is the perfect opportunity for greater cooperation between the United States and China. Instead, we saw greater rivalry. There is an old African proverb which says, when elephants fight, the grass suffers. We are the grass. International peace, security, and cooperation is the grass. Global trade, finance, economy is the grass. The planet is the grass. So we all have a stake in how the relations between United States and China develops. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker who needs no introduction. Every foreign minister believes that their term in office is the most historic. Of course, most of the time it's true. Maybe yes, no. Ina Eriksson Sereide became the foreign minister of Norway three years ago. Now that seems like BC. So much has happened. But even more important, so much change has happened. And she has had a ringside seat to these historic developments. So, and she has done a fantastic job in leading Norway's efforts to win the Security Council seat in the United Nations. A Security Council seat is exciting in normal times. Now, when there is so much rivalry and tensions and uncertainties, maybe it's a little too exciting. So let's hear from the foreign minister. Um, uh, may I hand over the, uh, uh, the, the well, the, what, should, what should we say? Normally I would say the floor is yours, but the screen is yours, foreign minister. Well, thank you so much, Anita, and thank you also to the organizers for actually doing this. Um, I think it is a very good example of how we can work in these uh, corona times, as we usually say. And I will then be the Oslo uh, part of this huge network of uh, speakers talking from Brussels, from DC, from Singapore, from London, uh, and also from, from Oslo. And again, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this, is a, this has become part of the tradition of a foreign minister in Norway to participate in uh, Arndal and also for Global Outlook. And this 
uh, year is no exception. This is the third time I'm doing this. But of course, um, this year is different. Obviously, um, it is different uh, for the fact that I'm looking at you through this small lens I have just right in, in front of me here. Um, but it's also different in so many ways, both both big and small. I guess it's fair to say, as Anita alluded to, that 2020 has really been the recent, uh, the year in recent memory that has shown us the most surprising turn of events. And that says a lot, because as Anita also pointed to, there has been some major changes, upheavals, and also, uh, I would say, unrest uh, in these years that we have just put behind us. So when preparing for this year's global outlook, I was reminded of the old saying that um, making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. And that rings true for today's topics as well, I have to say. Cooperation and conflict in the 2020s. Of course, then, with a particular focus on China. When trying to make sense of everything, as I think all of us are trying to, a lot of people tend to look back at the 90s. Or they look back at the 90s and they say things were very, very different back then. Both the world and the future uh, looked different in the 90s. I believe that some of the unease that we are feeling today can to some extent be explained by the great optimism of the 1990s. Many of us thought, myself included, I have to say, that democracy and human rights, free trade and freedom would kind of spread itself all over the world almost by its own accords. Very, very few think that today. Uh, today, human rights are under pressure even here at our own continent. In several countries, democracy and the rule of law is being undermined and authoritarian forces are taking over. While I think we have a tendency to uh, simplify and romanticize about the 25 years that has passed from the 1990s to 2015, it is nevertheless true, as I mentioned earlier, both the world and the future looked very different in the 90s. One of the biggest changes between then and now is, of course, the rise of China. For much of its history, China has been a major power. After a lapse of three centuries, it is making a resounding comeback. China has re-emerged as the world's largest trade and shipping nation, the world's second biggest economy, the world's second biggest military power, and also a technological giant. It may well be that the longest chapter in the future history books about our time will be the one about China. And some of the unease in some quarters about China these days is really not very surprising. To a certain degree, it has to do with the sheer size and, and also global reach of the new China. The pace at which it has risen to prominence as well as, I would say, a growing awareness of the differences in terms of political values, ideas, and worldviews. And in line with its power, China will, of course, seek to shape international norms and institutions, just like other great powers have done before China. And as a result of economy, of size, of military and economic power, it will continue to evolve as a serious contender to U.S. and Western power. So if one thing we can say for sure about the coming decade, it is that the relationship between China and the U.S. will be a defining feature of international politics. The post-World War II order, which of course was never perfect, it has been favorable to Norwegian interests, and I dare say to global interests as well. In support of stability, of economic growth, and the reach of values anchored in respect for democracy, individual rights, and opportunities. It has been underwritten by the United States based on liberal values and ideas that we share. The U.S. remains Norway's most important ally, 
and NATO remains the backbone of Norwegian security policy. And it is an alliance, I have to say, that also has room for disagreements. But nonetheless, it is a defining pillar, not just for Norway's security architecture, but for the relations with the world around us. Observing the relationship between China and the U.S. today gives cause for concern. We are seeing count, uh, contours of not only a trade dispute. In fact, we are seeing worrying trends, if they were not worrying enough being a trade dispute, that is much deeper and holds strategic confrontation as part of it. When I say cause for concern, that's not to say that there um, is rivalry, that rivalry and competition in itself is very surprising or very alarming. In fact, one can hardly expect things to be otherwise. Given the size, the power, the influence of these two nations, there is bound to be areas where their respective interests intersect. But what we should be concerned about is precisely the topic of today, whether we are seeing a development that, to a sufficient extent, promotes cooperation over conflict, whether we are seeing a development that leads to more engagement, even when dis disagreement is at the core or if we are seeing a development towards less engagement. But the course of history is not deterministic. Bipolarity does not inevitably lead to instability, to rivalry, to conflict, as I do see that some tend to think. I don't accept that we are in a scenario that retraces the steps of Athens and Sparta, that the turn of the 20th century Great Britain and Germany, or NATO and the Warsaw Pact. History may repeat itself, but always within the context and with its own characteristics, not through traps or inevitability. What matters is the way we handle differences and the choices that we make. As the past 40 years have shown, the emergence of new powers can also contribute greatly to global wealth, to stability and security. And trying to kind of wish away uh, the fact that there is a strategic rivalry and competition will just not work. But we can try to contribute towards a managed competition and engagement. And if we try to see it through this particular lens, I believe that there is a role to play for countries like Norway. First of all, where there is less dialogue, there is always the risk for misunderstandings and miscalculation. And in great power rivalry, a miscalculation or a misunderstanding could be fatal. There is a market for interlocutors, not as some sort of a peace broker, but just filling in the blanks and providing context and supplement. Secondly, the world is much too interdependent and intertwined for us to afford confrontation evolving into isolation or decoupling. Well, there will certainly be areas of international competition that will be prone to distrust and where cooperation will be very, very difficult. But there is still a pressing need to define some sort of safe zones for international cooperation in pursuit of what is a common interest. On everything from climate change to international trade, we need both the US and China to both cooperate and contribute. Well, central to achieving this safeguarding and strengthening the multilateral system and ensuring China and other emerging powers are on the one hand given the rights and influence commensurate with their rise, but also that they take their responsibilities and obligations commensurate with their international footprint. When Norway from January on, as Anita pointed to, has a seat on the UN Security Council, both the US and China will be partners in many of our priority areas. This is, there is a range of examples that shows the benefit of cooperation and coexistence with major powers. Inevitably, 
there will be competition, disagreement, and also potential conflict. But I firmly believe that vigilance and engagement within the framework of a strong multilateral system is the answer. Containment, confrontation, and decoupling are not. And finally, just getting back to where I started, and the difficult task of trying to predict the future. It is always a very difficult task given by the Global Outlook team, but this time in particular, I would say. I strongly believe that we are not merely observers to history. We are participants. There's a quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln that says, the best way to predict your future is to create it. And I believe that to be true. Cooperation or conflict is a choice. Unfortunately, with the cards that we have been dealt, rivalry and inaction placed into the hand of conflict, not cooperation. Action and initiative, on the other hand, seem to be facing great obstacles right now. It is a lazy argument to make that to come up with reason why conflict will prevail. But the strongest argument in favor of cooperation and of action and initiative in pursuit of this cooperation is precisely to think through to its logical, but I would also say terrifying conclusion, the scenario for conflict. Quite simply, it is a scenario that we cannot afford, and therefore it is a scenario we cannot allow. You all can, of course, count on us to be one of the determined countries to try to find avenues for cooperation in the 2020s. But I will just end with a sentence that I uh, also alluded to earlier. What happens with our development is a result of our choices. We are not observers, we are participants. And the course of history, the course of politics still can be changed. Thank you very much for once again having me here. And I know that Anita probably have prepared us question or two for, for me and the others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ina. Of course, uh, you know, you are so clear and you definitely did not pull any punches. So I was just thinking that is there any way that we could make you the foreign minister of the world? It's a serious question. Oh, oh, it, it was a question. Oh. <laughs> oh, you took it as a fact, right? <laughs> 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 no, but jokes apart, I just wanted to, um, my first question really is about, uh, you know, what we sometimes now call as the Pompeo Doctrine, this uh, whole thing that he outlined at the Nixon uh, Memorial Library. Um, it just And he drew this as an ideological war. We thought all these things were behind us, but now there it is. He has clearly drawn a battle between, as he calls it, freedom and tyranny in this ideological construct. Is that how you see this? Well, well as I said in my introduction, there is absolutely no doubt that there is a difference in the approach to uh, basic value to uh, democracy, to human rights, aspects. And at the same time, I think it is fair to say that for the world today to overcome some of the major, major challenges we face up until recently, we were talking about climate change issues and we were talking about security issues. Now we can also talk about health crisis and a pandemic that absolutely knows no borders, as we have seen, where we depend even more heavily on international cooperation like we've never done before. At that point in time, uh, cooperation is essential, but it goes both ways. Uh, and I think it is fair to say that what we have seen in the past months and weeks, where health crisis has also evolved into a great part of the great power rivalry that we are seeing uh, between China and the U.S., is really not beneficial for anyone. And you alluded to it in the beginning. The situation that we're in right now actually calls for greater cooperation. And you would think that that was the very natural answer to give to what we are seeing. Unfortunately, some of the more, I would say, um, 
the more worrying trends that we have seen over time has just been exacerbated. And, and we see that the tendency towards more isolationism, towards more unilateralism, and even transactional strategies just seem to be more at the forefront. So, so in our opinion, there is a need for more cooperation, and that cooperation has to include the great powers and not be part of a rivalry between them. That's right. You made a very eloquent plea for making the right choices, managing the strategic um, confrontation competition. Uh, but that's not the direction that we are seeing uh, that is uh, going ahead in the world, uh, especially from the United States side, uh, and also to some extent perhaps from China's side. So the question is, which is bothering everyone in the world, is are we slowly but inevitably heading towards um, uh, kind of a Cold War, a new version of a Cold War? Uh, well, I certainly hope we are not, but I do see some worrying signs in, in the sense that this uh, strategic rivalry is, is much, much deeper than many predicted or saw in the beginning. I've, I've recently taken issue with many who've said that this is more or less a trade dispute, as it is it's much more than that. It's a deep strategic rivalry. And I think it is also uh, important to remind ourselves that this is one of the, uh, I would say, few topics that gather bipartisan support in the U.S., meaning that uh, whether or not we see a continued Trump administration or we see a Biden administration after November 3rd, uh, I think we have to expect that the rivalry between the U.S. and China, because both sides have a tendency to, to keep it alive, will continue. And um, the question we have to ask ourselves is, of course, how we can maneuver and how we can manage this, because it affects all of us. Uh, I, I was very often asked when we had the campaign for the Security Council whether or not it was a wise idea for Norway to get into the Security Council because we will be in the middle of, of this great power rivalry. Uh, and, and I always answered that, well, we are there today. Uh, every nation faces the consequences, more or less, of the fact that the U.S. and China uh, are having this strategic rivalry and this deep, uh, deep-rooted competition. Uh, and we have to face that every day uh, in the choices that we make. It is nothing exceptional uh, if we enter into the Security Council that this would look very different. Uh, and I would say that, I mean, we have a good relationship with all the permanent members of the Security Council, uh, one of them being our, our closest ally, the U.S., uh, but we, of course, also take a stand when we disagree with the U.S., as we do when we disagree with China or France or U.K. or other uh, countries. Uh, Foreign Minister, we have some questions now from uh, Room 2. Helena, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Foreign Minister, for, uh, for sharing your time with you and your views. We have here a question from uh, the Vice Rector of the University of Agder, Guril Hannas. Thank you. Uh, University of Agder has one of uh, Norway's largest research groups on artificial intelligence and we also undertake research in other fields that may be seen as sensitive, such as wireless communication. Our technology researchers have so far been careful and restrictive in their relations to China. Uh, and at the same time, the government's panorama strategy encourages Chinese collaboration. Will we likely see modifications to the Panorama strategy going forward? And what is your advice to the U of A research groups working in sensitive and high-tech areas as they expand uh, their international remit? Well, it is a, um, a good and a very interesting question to, from Gerald. I think the work that you are doing and the research that you are conducting is extremely important because it brings not only Norway forward, but also uh, many other uh, countries and, and sectors. And I think um, when we talk about re research, uh, sometimes it's easy to forget that research in its nature is international. It depends heavily on cooperation. We see it on a daily basis when we are part of the EU research programs in different kinds. We see it when we send our researchers abroad to do research together with others, and when we have foreign uh, researchers coming to Norway to conduct their science and research here. What uh, is obviously something that uh, has been concerning also for our intelligence services is that from some countries, they do see a tendency towards using research as a platform for other activities. 
And that is something that I think all countries right now are very mindful of. Um, and that does not change our strategy on cooperating to, to drive through the best uh, strategy is the best research, but it of course also uh, entails a cautious approach to some of the issues that uh, that you are looking at. But as as you have said, you you have a very broad research cooperation with many countries, and it seems to be a cooperation that is going well. Uh, at least that is what it looks like from the outside. Helena, do you have any more questions from no, that room? No, more questions here. So thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Foreign Minister, for being with us today. And uh, we really miss your physical presence. You've been a great supporter of Global Outlook. But, of course, we understand the changed circumstances. So thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Anita, and to everyone also in the audience. Uh, it has always been a pleasure to be in Global Outlook um, today, uh, today, and this year is absolutely no exception, and I'm really hoping that we can meet physically next year. And I have to say that uh, hearing the sound of a little bit of an applause was a new experience that I really haven't heard for many months, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> applause. <laughs> like adding on the cheer at a football match. I understand now that when you watch a football match on TV, you can choose whether or not you would like to add some, some sounds. And, and for the experience, it is always wonderful to hear some of the sounds. So best of luck with the, the rest of this event. And it was a pleasure to be with you again, as always. Thank you. Thank you so much. The foreign minister mentioned that um, no matter who is in power after November 3rd, there's going to be tougher action with regard to China. Why is there bipartisan support in the United States for uh, being tough on China? The reason is really that what a Pew research showed that 66% of Americans have an unfavorable view of China. And this is not a view that prevails only in the United States. It is there to be found in different parts of the world. China has been assertive of late, whether it is internally with the Uyghurs or Hong Kong or in the neighborhood with the South China Seas or across the Himalayas with uh, India or across the oceans taking issue with uh, Australia or having fights with UK, US or Canada. But the question is, why is China doing this? Is it that China is just filling a vacuum left behind by a retreating United States? Or could it be that it, there is a deeper shift? China is done biding its time, hiding its strength, rising peacefully. It feels it has risen, must be given its due respect, and wants to show that it can and will flex its muscles, whether it's military or economic or uh, just plain rhetoric. Or is it that China is going to be uh, very preoccupied with its huge problems internally? But engagement with the world has benefited China hugely. So when the United States is talking about decoupling from, uh, from, uh, from China, how is that going to impact uh, China? How is China going to react to this so-called decoupling that the United States is now talking about? Um, what is China's own strategy going ahead into the future, into the 2020s? Let's hear from a very famous and a very popular China scholar, GAU, Dr. GAU, uh, who's with the Chatham House, and she joins us now from London, and she will be talking to us on a self-reliant China, what to expect in the 2020s. Ah, lovely. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to join this edition of Global Outlook. I'm participated in Norway. I'm delighted to join such a distinguished panelist and just really cannot compete with your foreign minister to any sense whatever. So what I'm trying to do in here today is just try to bring up perhaps something rather unusual and perhaps something that you may not heard so much in the Western media on what is actually China think about in itself um, for its future decade. 
to going ahead to be uh, somehow the second largest economy in the world. So the notion that China will emerge stronger from the crisis, that looking for seeking the uh, field vacuum left in the global leadership left by retreating in the United States, has really become a conventional wisdom among the Western commentators. And many Western political establishment argue that China actually projects power and secure its national interest and could be summarized in three ways. And three ways, all the letter beginning with M. So China exercising its economic and military might, spending money, utilizing its financial resources by introducing the Belt and Road Initiative, and also by expressing its own mindset, its ideology internationally through pushing through the pandemic diplomacy, which is so far is really badly received across many developed world. But however, judging by a series of gathering from the Chinese leadership in the past six months or so, Beijing is actually more focusing on managing its own economic enemies than leading the world. He holds is a cardinal principle that no matter how complicated international situation has become, China must prioritize the management of its own affairs. So this has really resonated loud and clear at the time of crisis. So what China has done, and in terms of managing its relationship with Washington DC, and what China has done in terms of managing its economic, domestic economic challenges, which I'm going to bring up in the next 10 minutes or so. So behind a really exorbitant choirs of pandemic diplomacy, which we have heard recently performed by Chinese, many Chinese ambassadors and diplomats, there has, there has actually been a very sober note and sober tone of the international challenges really posed in the corridor of Beijing, inside the power, power corridor of Beijing. So even Washington, even the United States, adding tensions at all fronts, it has been quite clear sometimes that Beijing does not really intend in terms of making the relation one out of control as really walking the tight rope on the one hand, responding the, um, the attacks from the United States, whereas on the other hand, the Chinese leaders doesn't want to be seen as being weak at home as well. So President Xi Jinping so far has been conspicuously absent from making any direct public comments regarding what China want to do, what China want to adopt was in terms of Washington's provo provocative move and mostly leave the Minister of Foreign Affairs and official media to fighting back. So really in the mindset of the Chinese leaders, um, United States is clearly tricking China officials to behave irrationally. So the bilateral ties can really be allowed to continue from bad to worse, really for the sake of domestic politics of the United States. As the presidential election looming and drawn much closer, and Trump administration seems to embracing um, one leadership disaster after another in terms of combating coronavirus. So in the next two months, both in the business community and as well as in the policy community wonder what will be other extraordinary moves made by the United States um, to roll out in order to rattling Beijing and rattling the feathers of Beijing. Nobody knows. Now the Chinese leadership used to be known for building a united front and the joint forces to fight um, fascism during the Second World War but actually, in reality, it is now the United States is aggressively pushing Western alliances and other form of united front against China. But I don't really think it is in Beijing's best interest to be in that situation of China vis-a-vis -vis the rest. This is not really doing any good for the Chinese regime. Now, a group of policy hawks within Trump's administration have gone really at any length in terms of destabilizing China, and in particularly, Mike Pompeo trying to separate the Chinese Communist Party and vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese people. However, I have to say that Pompeo's strategy would only stoke Chinese nationalism and rally popular support around the President Xi Jinping and the Communist Party at a time when Pompeo claimed that the United States want to empower the Chinese people to induce internal changes in the party's behavior from within the Chinese domestic sphere. So I think perhaps he will fail quite miserably to some extent. Um, Chinese leadership also present a rather grim assessment in terms of its own domestic economic landscape as been seen in the past few months so far. Now, I'm sure many of the business people, business audience in here do know that China quite often present the annual GDP target um, in doing every year when it's a National People's Congress. But for the first time this year, since 1985, China and the Chinese government did not manage to come up 
with a proper GDP growth target. Why? Partially it's because a staggering GDP target alone it is actually no longer being seen as a panacea to be able to surmount all the challenges faced by China in the post-COVID-19 world. And instead, I think really stabilizing soaring unemployment to create extra 9 million new jobs for the young people, eradicating absolute poverty, and also increasing cash flows to small to medium enterprises really beyond anything else. And that's really on the top of the to-do list for the Chinese leaders. Without proper jobs, ordinary Chinese people could potentially turn into a hugely disruptive forces challenge societal stability, as it happened in many parts of the world. And facing a collapse of global demand and transitioning economy less depending on export, can the Chinese Communist Party guarantee everyone a salary? The answer is really unsure. So Beijing has begun to encourage export-led manufacturers to focusing on selling to the domestic market. But I'm afraid this transition will be very painful and it take much longer time. So Beijing's latest strategy to cope with less accommodating international environment, it is to use so-called dual circulation. What we mean by dual circulation is really to push through domestic economic growth and domestic consumption. The message is very clear that China has relied more on itself in terms of sustained economic growth. So China will have to cut its reliances on overseas markets to keep factories running, and it will have to develop its own technology so that the United States or any other countries cannot easily threaten the economy through embargoes or sanctions. Now, obviously, it is very interesting to say, it's very easy to say um, for the Chinese government to come up with a strategy, but that strategy, it is clearly has now deviated from what Deng Xiaoping has advocated back to 1979, open up to the world. Now, it seems to be this whole idea of self-reliance, it seems to a little bit go back to um, Chairman Mao's era. And this whole idea of self-reliance is very much deeply rooted in the ruling Chinese Communist Party's mindset and back to 1950s, because the Chinese has learned the lesson of the time when it split up with the Soviet Union and therefore, it has to rely on its own technology development in order to sustain itself. But whether this would work, um, we really don't sure. Because partially, it is um, much hope that domestic consumption would increase, and that would also require the Chinese consumers would have sufficient spending power, and that would also require the Chinese people would have a job. But for so far, I don't really see how whatever the revenue that would exist to regenerate the job creation. Um, obviously, it's a similar challenge for any other countries, irrespective whether it's in the capitalism economy or it's authoritarian regime like China. So um, another really a key challenge for Xi Jinping is he, if, when he came to power back to seven years ago, and he promised that he would have to eradicate the absolute poverty judging by the UN standard. What I mean by absolute poverty here, it is per household income below $1.9 per day. And he promised that he will have to eradicate the absolute poverty by the end of this year. But really in a precarious time like, like it is now, and whether Xi Jinping will be able to deliver, and we don't know. It is really essential for that Xi Jinping and his team will have to try to prevent a perception of failure in managing economy from being widely spread among really anxious Chinese people as well. Now, I think part of the reason to draw in here, it is also throughout the economic development of China in the last 40 years or so, and China has become from a most equal society into the world's most unequal countries. And I often joke this with my um, foreign friends um, when I was in the UK, and often said that more than Chinese society are shaped by two Germans at the far end of each political spectrum. So from the Karl Marx's idea of social inequality and communism to the German designer Karl Lagerfeld, worshipped by super rich for its extravagant taste. And China is essentially captured on both ends of the spectrum. And this is actually just to show how divisive and how unequal this country will be. So this has also worsened by the pandemic as well. And again, Xi Jinping's um, key challenge, it is to have to make sure those people who live below under the poverty line 
be able to improve their living standards. And just try to show you a very interesting number. Um, this number was given by Premier Li Keqiang uh, back in, in June. Interestingly, 40% of the total Chinese population still living under poverty and still living under an income of $200 a month. So 40% of the Chinese population. And judging by become the world's second largest economy, and you still have that 40% of population living such low income. And therefore, I would actually consider the challenge for China, it is not to, on the one hand, of course, it's about managing the United, uh, United States. But even more importantly, how to manage its own domestic inequality. I think what we have argued in here is irrespective, irrespective which political regime you are, at the end of the day, is the trust between the, the governor and the governed that matters. And obviously for China, it is a very different kind of social contract compared with, for example, what he would have in Norway, or for example, they would have in the UK. It's the social contract that China's Communist Party will have to deliver that sustainable level of living standard in order to make sure that population do not question on political freedom. So how easy China can, can deliver that? We don't really know. We're coming into a very precarious time. Since joined WTO, since China joined WTO, China has really created jobs and wealth, while the rest of the world have enjoyed a wider choice of products and services available at lower prices. But however, I think I'm afraid all good things might come to the all must come to the end. China is no longer be seen as a benign force, and neither does it want to wish to pay out through uh, for the rest of the world through a massive economic stimulus package like what China has done back to 10 years ago. So challenges to China's economic model are increasing as witnessed by the ongoing tussles between Washington and Beijing. Um, but what I have to put forward in here is really this coronavirus, it is a signpost for China and the world for a direction of self-reliant China in the post-pandemic world. And also as the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party will come approach next year by 2021. The, this party must tell a convincing story about its economic, economic policy would work for everyone inside China, not just the very rich few on the very top, but for everyone, 1.4 billion population. And that is story, it is not about victor's conclusion for fighting COVID-19 or personal glorification of Xi Jinping, but the rather really that story and that justification will somehow try to show the legitimacy of the party by providing job and social stability. But that is much easier said than done. So I'm afraid I present you a rather grim picture inside China, but that's really the reality where we are now. So come back to the beginning, what I said, instead of busy of filling the vacuums of the international leadership, actually China is for in its own hand, busy with its own domestic affairs. So I ended in here and much look forward to hear your questions and comments. Thank you, GAU, for your wonderful uh, presentation of China, a very, very realistic uh, painting, a re very realistic picture of what is going on right inside China. It's very interesting what you're saying because you are talking about China being more bothered and concerned about eradicating poverty and all the other domestic uh, concerns. And mm -hmm. on the other side, you have the United States talking about decoupling. So it seems like a perfect fit. You know, like a match made in hell. Uh, <laughs> you know, if that was, it was life was as simple as that, that would be good. But the point is, China has been a very successful export oriented economy. Now, to move away from that would seem like, you know, literally cutting the branch on which you're sitting. Mm. It is. Um, I think actually, this whole idea of decoupling, uh, we're talking much talk about it. We, we thought it would be introduced by Donald Trump, it's actually introduced by the Chinese back to the 1950s when China had a fight with the Soviet Union, when Soviet Union decided to withdraw all the technologies and all the support from China. So from then, the Chinese learned very clear lesson that it has to own technology by itself. It has to own certain things by itself. It cannot rely on external forces to rejuvenate in growth. But obviously, the last 40 years, this helped China become prosperous. But how long this would last? 
we don't think it would last for much longer. Partially it's because there's such a weak uh, global demand. Because if Chinese economy is too much dependent on the global economic growth, and therefore that would make China's international situation even harder. Now, if we're talking about decoupling and how likely and how easy that would be, I'm afraid I have to say I very much agree with what just four minutes just said. The world is deeply intertwined and the world is deeply um, connected with each other. So if you want to suddenly just withdraw China, become that very important element or hub of international manufacture. And for me, that seems to be just very much a wish for thinking. Just to give you one very short example, as we know, in the beginning of this pandemic, many countries have a shortage in terms of PPE, personal protection equipment. And that would also equally apply to China. So by the end of the January, and China was actually one out of face masks because it does not, it didn't produce any face mask. But after a month, so one small cluster, small man, uh, manufacturer in southern China, be able to produce over 300,000 masks a day. Why? It's because China have all these raw materials and all those infrastructures and assemblers be able to quickly gathering and assemble, manufacturing certain equipments in a very short period of time. So that really to show you that even, yes, you can cut off China, you can shift things supply chain away from China, but where would be the replacement? It would be the Vietnam or Laos would be an interesting replacement, which would have sufficient infrastructure in order to assemble, to produce things. So I think the question here, yes, we can draw a wishful list, but how likely that wishful list will become reality and we don't know. You're absolutely right about this intertwining, and so it's going to be mm. very interesting to see how this concept of decoupling can even work. Uh, it's like, mm. how can China and uh, United States quarantine themselves against each other? It doesn't seem possible. Uh, but uh, going to another uh, issue about how the world is reacting to China, mm. perhaps within China, they see it as the world ganging up against them. But the fact is there has been a global backlash against China. It's a pandemic of course, aggravated it, and but there are many other issues uh, that have surfaced. So how does this uh, really work around? Because what we, we see from outside is that China is not backing down. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, you, you see on the one hand, you have this whole idea of so-called war for warrior diplomacy and sending this, all these exuberant notes and try to coerce um, foreign diplomats. But it's a pretty ineffective way of making friends and making communication. What I felt somehow is China, um, because of its economic status, it has not developed somehow a sense of self-centered diplomacy. It is always what China wants. But when it comes to collaboration, it is not just about what China wants, but it is also about what others want as well. It is also about trying to cre create that sense of perception of itself and how that perception faded into the Western audiences faded into the Western governments. And those Western governments will have to make on decisions based on those perceptions towards China. So it is not about China in terms of reality, but it's actually it's about China in terms of creating that perception. And I think so far, China has not been very successful in terms of creating that perception to be benign to the rest of the world. Uh, thank you, uh, GAU. We have some a question from the audience here. Is there a question from the audience here? Yes, please. Uh, if you could come to the microphone. My name is Kristen Wolowick. I'm the Dean at the School of Business and Law. Dr. Yu Li, first of all, I really want to thank you very much for an interesting talk. It was uh, highly relevant and very interesting. You have previously assessed the expansion and role of Chinese companies in Europe. China, China Blue Star is also one of the key actors in our region in the southern part of Norway. What would be your general forecast on, for Norway when it comes to Chinese companies? Will we continue to see an expansion? And what is the most optimal way for Norway to engage with Chinese companies that are going global? Thank you. 
That's a very, very good question. Thank you so much for this. And again, thank you so much for having me in here. Um, now, regarding China and Norway, and obviously the two countries have uh, had really difficult times in the past few years because of the Nobel Prize, and as far as I understand. Now, in terms of the Chinese company going abroad, I think this will be a general trend, not just for Norway, but also for Europe and for Chinese company to go to Europe and the United States or any other part of the world in general is the Chinese investment in the next five to 10 years or so will scale back because this whole idea is of the so-called dual circulation, that word which is I just referring to, the self-reliance, that sense of giving all the focus within the domestic economy, within domestic job creation, and therefore the Chinese government will have to issue policy to prefer that Chinese companies scale back on international and foreign investments. Now, in terms of Norway and China, especially on the business front, how can, how can they collaborate with each other? I think the Chinese company will have to learn a lesson, which is about commercial rule of law. When they come to engage with foreign businesses, commercial rule of law will have to be adhering to. The Chinese cannot just, um, through certain um, different measures or play different rule books in order to conduct in collaboration. I think the most important thing is to have the proper rule of law installed and also lay those rules very clearly to see what are the benefits and what are the losses. And most importantly, what that Chinese company cannot do. I mean, for example, in the UK, we're now having this debate regarding um, Chinese investment about Huawei or about civil nuclear. I think the trouble is largely because the British government has not really set up very clearly a rule on which sector that foreign investors, not just Chinese investors, foreign investors can invest, and which sector foreign investors cannot invest, and therefore causing all different U-turns and blurring lines. So I think really we need to be very clear what each actor can do and what each actor, more importantly, cannot do. Thank you so much, uh, UJ. Please stay on because we are joined by an excellent panel. So we'll have a short panel discussion before we take more questions uh, from the audience. We are joined by uh, Helge Olsen, who is a former uh, CEO of Elcom and a member of many, many boards. He's also the chairman of Ida Cluster and also the uh, chairman of Norwegian Industry Association. And then we have uh, Stina Torriesen, the most energetic, uh, absolutely dynamic um, uh, associate professor of business and law in the University of Agder, a great pillar of support for Global Outlook. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Helge, if I may start with you. Um, you have so much experience, years and years, decades of experience working with China. Um, today, the mantra seems to be different. It is uh, all about, oh, if you put, depending on one country, read that as China, depending on one country for all your supply chain is a mistake. Would you agree? What was your assessment of the situation? I think many supply chains obviously have suffered from uh, increasing tension and trade barriers. But then on the other hand, I think it's a temporary uh, effect from this kind of measures. Companies tend to find ways uh, around that and uh, uh, through uh, re reloc or say re uh, re relocating manufacturing, um, global companies typically have manufacturing in mm. all over the world, and, and will find ways around it. So I think trade barriers, as such, is a relatively temporary and not very effective uh, way of uh, implementing policies. On the other hand, if you go to full embargo, it's a different story. Mm. Then. Of course, it becomes much so more difficult. So the way things are right now, what would be your advice to companies that want to have supply chains in China? No, I, th I think, uh, I think uh, temporary, it, it can create some difficulties. Um, obviously, uh, the way things have developed, you need, uh, you need to have more alternatives. But uh, as, I, as I said, I, I think those are, are being developed and... Um, I don't think global trade will, will stop just because we have uh, increased tension. It, mm. It's more a uh, change in, in how you uh, organize things. In I my mean, it's, you know, China is not that it's just cost effective. Uh, what people are talking about is the highly innovative supply chain that China has developed. So it's not just saving money or saving costs, but also the best possible solutions. So that is why probably at this point this decoupling can be uh, a major loss for everybody. But I th this is. 
uh, we have seen a lot of changes in the, in the last uh, five to ten years. I mean, China used to be the, the very low uh, or cheapest labor type of manufacturing. That has changed a long time ago yeah. already. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, already today uh, uh, big multinationals uh, are not so dependent on one country for their supply. Of mm -hmm. course, there are examples like that, but in general, I don't think that's, uh, that's a major problem. Mm. Stine, if I could ask you, uh, universities represent the future. Um, so give us the academic and the Norwegian perspective to this whole thing that we're discussing about rising tensions between the United States and China and decoupling and going inward. And how does this all impact? Uh, yes, well, thank you. Well, I think uh, the key thing here, I think, to t the, the kind of takeaway from the foreign minister's uh, speech is really her emphasis on that there is a kind of enduring strategic rivalry. Mm -hmm. And then the key question is, is kind of how will that play out? Um, I think what we've so far uh, to kind of add to the story today, the U.S. story here uh, is, of course, that we will have a lot of answers in November. Uh, mm -hmm. I, th I think for one thing is that uh, I think there is clearly a consensus in the US uh, that uh, we need to, that they need to rethink their relationship to China. Um, but it clearly, I think a democratic uh, win in the presidential ele election will, will reduce tensions. Mm. But the strategic rivalry will remain there. Uh, and I think, so, so that's kind of the, uh, the, we, the, the US equation here is, uh, is very uncertain. It will either, either bring and push tensions as uh, uh, Yuji has, uh, has uh, highlighted either push, uh, it will be pushing tensions with China kind of restraining and not kind of taking the bait, um, or it will be trying to kind of uh, men, uh, make amends. But we will have the strategic rivalry there, and I think the key takeaway from a kind of academic perspective and a Norwegian perspective uh, is really the re-emergence for Norway of, uh, of Europe and the importance that Europe will have uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Norway going for, uh, forward. We will, no matter what the, the shape of the relationship, it will be a tense rivalry, it will be a less tense rivalry. But we will balance, as the foreign minister highlighted. We will have to balance it, but so will all the other European powers as well. So what we need to do is, is, is kind of join the balancing act, join particularly the EU and the German, Germany's balancing act. I think what Germany is seeking is to kind of maintain the commercial relationships and, and what Helge is envisioning. Really, Germany is maintaining the commercial relations, uh, cooperating with China on solving climate change, for example, but also being careful in uh, dealing with China on these uh, in strategic sectors. And we, what, what will be the strategic and the sensitive sectors moving forward is a, is a key interesting point. But we have the 2020s will be a balancing act for Norway, and we need to, in a sense, invest even further in our, in our European relationship in order to manage hmm. the balancing act. That's really interesting because uh, of bringing in Europe, and we do have a focus on Europe in our uh, second session. Elga, by the way, um, what about green shift? You know, we were going in a particular direction, but now all these developments, do you think this is going to retard the whatever little progress that uh, the world was making? Or will it accelerate it, or will it retard it? I think economic growth clearly will be retarded by... Uh by increasing tension, and of course now, in particular, by the pandemic. Mm. But I think China has been a leading uh, country in terms of, uh, of uh, developing their economy into, uh, into a more sustainable one. And, um, and um, I think uh, this is not uh, maybe only about environmental, uh, the environmental challenge. It's, it's about technology development and in improvement in efficiency, and, and that's not going to stop, uh, regardless of, uh, of the political situation we have today. So I, th I think that's... Uh, I'm not pessimistic at all about, uh, about the green, okay. green shift. I yeah. think uh, temporarily some slowdown, but that's, that will continue. Okay. Okay. We have some questions um, from room two um, for both of you all, as well as uh, UGA. Can we go to room two? Elena, are you there? Yes. Hello from uh, this uh, other room. Uh, we have uh, one question already. If there are others who want to have a question, give me uh, a, a cue. But uh, first of all, we have uh, Geir Hegum, who is the CEO of uh, Business Region, Kristiansand. Ah, dear Yuji, um, thank you very much for your, uh, sharing your excellent insights on China and Europe. Um, you have the privilege of being uh, very well acquainted with both the Asian as well as the European politics and business culture. Um, what is it that many Europeans miss 
when we do the assessing of the development in Asia? And where do you think our blind spots are? And what can we do to remedy them or, or to mitigate them? Yeah, that's, that's a million dollar question. Thank you so much for this excellent question. Uh, there's no really immediate answers or advice I can give, but I think one thing which European missed so far is to have the eyes not just on the current generation of the Chinese business leaders or the Chinese political leaders, but really to have the eyes on the Chinese young people and to look into what their consumer behavior and what do we want. And obviously, this generation of the Chinese young people become far more confident and far more internationally uh, familiar with, compared with their parents or even their parents before. And they seem to be not really accepting European or American ways of living or lifestyles as how the um, how their previous generation parents would accept. So this whole idea is of generation shift, I think perhaps many European companies is really not really ready and yet to be prepared. I mean, just want to give you a very perfect example. Um, recently, um, you see the, the sales on mobile phones for Huawei become searched much higher than the sales in Apple. And partially it's because this current generation of Chinese young people become far more nationalistic and they felt somehow, instead of supporting America, instead pay tribute to the United States, they should perhaps supporting its own national brand. So, I mean, this kind of changing in terms of consumption behavior, and especially on young people's behavior, I really didn't really see much European companies has been looking to. So that will be a generation shift. And the second thing is this whole idea is on cultural difference and cultural awareness. So the Chinese is very much interesting, interested in about um, style over substance. What I mean by style over substance is Chinese are interested in European brand. Uh, if that brand are particularly not particularly famous and Chinese do not buy into it, because part of the reason it is to have that sense of aspiration of being a Chinese middle class of acquiring some kind of European brand to own it, rather than really just the substance of the product by itself. So generation shift and also step step style over substance, these are two things perhaps the European companies could be focusing on, on the Chinese consumers. Well, thank you very much for sharing. And uh, well, I was lucky enough to spend four years in China, and I do believe you have a very, very valid point about the generation shift, mm. uh, especially seeing the last five to 10 years and from a Western perspective, it's easy to look at China as it was 10, 15 years ago, while it's actually changed completely through the last five or 10 years, especially when it comes to how the young people look on what they want, how to do things, etc. So thank you very much. No problem. So um, I think uh, we have uh, we are running out of time, so we will take a five minute break just so that you can stretch your legs. And after the uh, break, we will be joined by our keynote speakers from Singapore and uh, Brussels. So see you in five. Thank you. Welcome back. As you may have noticed, uh, in our first session, our star speaker, Edward Luce, could not make it. He had a stomach bug, so um, we regret that very much. We were all looking forward to uh, listening to him. And now we begin our second session. You know, there has been a global backlash against globalization which has resulted in the rise of nationalism and protectionism in many countries. It's not just Donald Trump who talks about America first, it's even Joe Biden. Uh, when you examine his policies, it seems to be pretty much be American, by American. Uh, so it is something that is, uh, the question is, is globalization under threat? Is global trade under threat? Or could it be, I mean, to be optimistic, could it be that, you know, some of the, there could be a course correction and some of the, uh, the side effects of uh, global trade and globalization could be addressed, issues like uh, deindustrialization in the West, job losses, inequalities. If these things are addressed, perhaps the world could continue to benefit from the positive outcomes of uh, globalization. 
Uh, talking on this subject is Andrea Soman Pau, who is the chairman of the BW Group, uh, a world leader in the maritime industry. He's very interesting because he combines East and West. So he is Austrian by nationality, grew up in Hong Kong, uh, studied in uh, Shanghai and uh, Taiwan, and then later went on to study in Oxford and Harvard. He joins us now from Singapore, and uh, he will be speaking on global trade in the 2020s, um, the, some key trends. Uh, Andreas, please. Thank you, Anita, uh, and to the organizers for this opportunity to speak about world trade. Uh, let me start with some headlines. <clears throat> My first point is that global trade has been a bedrock of growth and prosperity for the past 50 years. It's not perfect but globalization is better than nationalism, and I will explain why. My second point is that trade growth has been slowing, and we can't just blame COVID because it started before the pandemic. I'll consider some of the reasons why this is happening. And I'll end my remarks with some reflections on what we might want to do to make things better. So allow me to start with some facts. I know these days opinions are more fashionable than facts, so I hope you will indulge me. <clears throat> Growth in global trade has been a miracle of the post-war era. In 1960, merchandise trade was 15% of global GDP. By 1990, it was 30%. And by 2008, it was over 50% of world GDP. This rise in trade coincided with a massive improvement in quality of life. In the span of just 25 years, the number of people in extreme poverty dropped by 1.2 billion, from 36% of the world's population to just 10%. Of course, there were other factors in this, but trade was a major contributor. We all know Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage, that international trade benefits all countries even if one country is more efficient in producing every single good. To use a colorful example, imagine going back to trading domestically. You might get French cheese and wine in France, <coughs> Apple products in America, and affordable clothes and electronics in China, but without access to global markets, you're unlikely to get them all. So we went through this period of rapid trade growth. From 1990 to 2008, trade volumes were increasing at two times GDP growth. Then it stalled. The multiplier dropped to about one times GDP growth after 2009. Trade was still growing, but more slowly. And then last year, it dropped again, this time below zero in real terms. In the last quarter of 2019, before COVID even arrived, Merchandise trade declined by an annualized 4.6%. I will consider why in a moment. And now to 2020, where we enter completely uncharted territory. WTO thinks that world trade will fall by 13 to 32% this year, depending on the duration and response to COVID. We're clearly just guessing at this point, but the signs are everywhere, not least in shipping. You might be wondering, what about services trade? Because this has actually been growing faster than goods trade in recent years and is now about one quarter of the total. But growth in services was also declining before COVID. With the exception of our friends in technology, services have been hit hard with the restrictions on movement and travel. Tourism now contributes about 10% of world GDP, $9 trillion and 330 million jobs. The UN is pointing to a potential decline of 60 to 80% this year, with over 100 million direct jobs at risk. I won't get into educational services, but clearly these are also heavily affected. Enough facts. You can see that the current outlook for trade is not good. But the important point I want to make is that we can't just blame it on COVID. This was already happening before this year, so we should not imagine that it miraculously goes away when COVID is gone. Which brings me to the question, why was trade slowing? Well, there are a number of possible reasons. 
containerization only started in 1956, and it unleashed a wave of global trade, taking us from 15% of global GDP to 50% now. But there is ultimately a limit to how many different things you can stuff into a box. And even with Ricardo's theory, it's hard to trade 100% of GDP globally. Technology is another factor. Automation, robotics, 3D printing, virtual connectivity all allow for reshoring of supply chains. A third factor is that we have been waking up to the risks of over-optimizing with trade. Running a tight global supply chain is a problem when there is a shock like a pandemic and you find yourself without any buffer or backup. And there were some comments about that earlier. Optimizing purely from a logistics perspective is also a challenge for the planet. Making shirts in Europe, sending them to China to have the button sewn on, and then sending them back for sale in Europe, that might be good for cost, but it's not good for the climate. But the single most important factor in declining trade is that the social narrative has changed and policies have followed. People have started to argue against globalization. Why? The biggest cause seems to be the decline in living standards for a large group of people, especially in the developed world and especially in relative terms. Now, trade may have contributed to this by creating a global labor market, but it is not just about trade. Automation is taking away jobs. But of course, it's easier to blame a foreigner than a robot. Low interest rates increase the gap between capital and labor, but it's easier to blame a foreign country than the Fed. Buying laws and votes with money has increased inequality, but it's easier to blame communism than democracy. In short, foreigners and globalization make for an easier political target. So we see policies being enacted against trade. The US-China trade war has dominated the headlines, but restrictions have been growing everywhere. According to WTO, import restrictions were applied on 0.5% of world goods in 2009. By 2017, it was 4%, and last year it reached 8%. Even in ASEAN, non-tariff measures have gone from 4,000 in 2015 to about 10,000 now. Now, before this all sounds too pessimistic, let me give you the good news, which is that many people still believe in free trade. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, is close to finalization, and it will lower tariffs for 30% of the world's population and GDP. The US-China relationship is also not all bad news. In fact, China's imports of energy and agri-products from the US have been rising this year, and last year's loss of exports from China was substituted by others like Vietnam. At a corporate level, businesses know that it's hard to reverse globalization. Fully loaded manufacturing wages in the US are $25 per hour, while in China it's $5 and in Vietnam $3. Reshoring means you lose proximity to global customers. And let's remember that China is not just a production center, but also a massive consumer market now. Which brings me to my closing remarks. <clears throat> Taking all of this into account, what are some ideas for trade in the future? Eight short suggestions. First, leaders have to focus on the real cause of the problem and shape policies and narratives accordingly. If global trade is to blame, then by all means address the trading rules. But shutting down trade as a scapegoat for other problems is like trying to cure COVID by ingesting cleaning products. Second, we should stop using the trade deficit as the only metric. When Apple makes a phone in China, it registers as a trade deficit with China, but the profits go to an American company. 40% of China's exports are made by foreign owned enterprises and JVs. Americans say that China is fleecing them with trade surpluses. But Americans just print pieces of paper to buy Chinese products. Who exactly is fleecing who? Third, understand that we have a common global interest. 
beggar thy neighbor doesn't work for pandemics, and it doesn't work when 50 million people re-enter extreme poverty, poverty and 250 million people face starvation, as the UN expects. If you think poverty and disease are someone else's problem, wait until we see mass migration of millions of people into the wealthier regions. We are only as strong as our weakest link. Fourth, we need to remember that trade relies not only on a willingness to engage with other countries and to make compromises, but also a willingness to abide by common rules. What we see now is increasing lawlessness. The leading economy in the world has pulled out of TPP, pulled out of the Paris Agreement, torn up the JCPOA, frozen the WTO, and is now pulling out of WHO in a pandemic. Fifth, in order to have common rules, we need to support multilateral institutions, not tear them down. The reason we had 65 years of peace was because the post-war leaders built WTO, the United Nations, World Bank, IMF. These institutions need reforming to keep them relevant, but tearing them down is not a path to success. Sixth, businesses do need to rethink their supply chains to be more resilient against shocks and to prevent climate change. But this is not an all or nothing approach where everything has to be brought back home. Seventh, use technology like blockchain to ensure that trade works smoothly. Banks have lost billions on trade finance in recent years, in part through fraud. The current system covers $18 trillion of goods trade and using paper like bills of lading is completely antiquated. Eighth, to address climate change, we need a carbon tax so that the environmental cost is reflected in how we trade. Don't ban trade or build barriers, just ensure that the proper costs are incorporated. My final point is on a more philosophical note, we need to start listening to each other. I don't know whether it's the echo chamber of social media, the ugly political statements, or just plain fear, but we are becoming increasingly tribal and dogmatic in our beliefs. Edward Luce wasn't here today, but he used the phrase extravagant self-belief in a recent article to describe why some countries have failed to deal with COVID. National unity and measured self-confidence, those are good things, but they need to be paired with global solidarity and some intellectual humility. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Andreas. That was a beautiful speech, and it is so much in alignment with the Foreign Minister of Norway. In fact, we have a question from the audience, which is precisely on this subject, and I'm going to read this out to you. Uh, if you were the Foreign Minister of a small northern European country, such as Norway, how would you navigate the US-China rift and what would be your long-term strategy vis-a-vis -vis China? So, uh, fortunately, I'm not the foreign minister of a country because it's a very challenging role right now. Actually, Singapore is facing a similar dilemma because it has historically had very close relations with the US, but obviously has a um, uh, lot of shared culture and uh, racial background with China and a lot of good relations with China. So it's trying to walk this tightrope between the two. Um, you know, I think that, and it was referred to by the foreign minister, I think dialogue is so important because, and, and dialogue doesn't just mean sitting down and talking to each other, but actually being willing to listen where the other side, to where the other side is coming from. And, you know, I think that what people would understand is that China is not an expansionary power. You know, it's never been a, an expansionary, um, it's never been an expansionary power. And uh, for 2000 years, it just wants to secure its borders, um, you know, by consolidating relationships with neighboring states. Uh, and I can go on and talk about Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia, which were uh, actually taken over by the Mongols and the Manchus, not by the Han Chinese. When they invaded China, they went on to take on Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia. Um, the Spratly Islands, uh, which everybody is very excited about and maybe with good reason, 
But, you know, there was a quid pro quo, <clears throat> which is that the U.S. would not provoke by sailing up and down the straits. I mean, if the Chinese Navy sailed 12 miles off the coast of California, do you think there would be a reaction to that? So we have to understand where are we provoking um, and where are we actually causing problems through preconceived ideas. Thank you. I think you might have a job waiting. Uh, <laughs> Um, we've been talking a lot about geopolitical tensions. We have a lot of uh, on trade, globalization. I want to swing to a personal question, if I may. Um, Andres, you, were, you grew up in Hong Kong. How do you feel when you see what's been going on in Hong Kong, the fact that it is this wonderful, great city has become uh, almost a battlefield between China and uh, United States, UK? How do you feel at a very personal level? Well, obviously, it's very sad to see this happening in Hong Kong because the people who suffer is actually the, the people of Hong Kong. Um, it's a very complex uh, topic, but I think the starting point for the success of any country is um, peace and the rule of law. And, you know, I think in all this excitement over this new national security law, some of the substance is lost in the rhetoric and the excitement. So let, let me just make a, few, a couple of points on this, because this is the current focus, is the new national security law. It covers four activities, secession, subversion of state power, terrorist activities, and collusion with foreign forces. Now, that is not totally dissimilar from national security laws elsewhere. There are three main criticisms of this law. One is, what is the underlying motive? There's a suspicion that China is trying to take over Hong Kong and that it's expansionary and so on. And, and we should remember, Hong Kong belongs to China. It is one, one country. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to want to restore the rule of law. Hong Kong has had petrol bombs, riots, and destruction of property for over a year. <clears throat> without China deploying federal forces. As a parallel, the US brought in the National Guard and armed federal forces within weeks, even days recently of rioting. The second question is, is it allowed under one country, two systems? And it is absolutely, Article 18 and Article 23 of the basic law says, by reason of turmoil within Hong Kong, which is beyond the control of the government, the central government may apply the relevant national laws. So it's actually legal as well. And the last point that people get excited about is extraterritoriality, where they say, wow, these laws can apply outside of Hong Kong or China. But the US has been applying extraterritoriality with sanctions and with the weaponization of, of the dollar. Every time the US dollar is used to threaten companies around the world, that's also extraterritoriality. Now, I'm not getting drawn into a who's right, who's wrong, because, you know, the US has underwritten global peace uh, for the far past 50, 60 years with Pax Americana. And, you know, they have some good arguments about IP and so on. But my point is that there are reasons and arguments on both sides, and we need to listen to them. Very true. And very often that's exactly what does not happen. And this is where, as the foreign minister was talking about, and what you reinforce the need for dialogue. Thank you so much, uh, Andreas. But we are not going to let you go. We, we will have you again when the, uh, we have our panel discussions. That will be a little later, about 15 minutes from now. But uh, bye for now. Thank you so much, Andreas. So while tensions rise between the United States and China, what is the world's largest bloc up to? Yes, the European Union. The EU does what the EU does best, collaboration. Of course, there is no shortage of fights and disputes and divisions within the, United, uh, within the European Union. But the fact is that collaboration is part of the EU's foundational DNA. And it is using this cooperation to launch the world's most ambitious sustainability platform or program. 
the EU's Green Deal. Talking to us on this subject is Angels Orduna, and she is the executive director of Aspire, a very prominent European association that promotes um, innovation and sustainability. And she joins us from Brussels and will be speaking on the industry's perspective on the EU's Green Deal. Angels, please go ahead. Uh, Angels, you must unmute yourself. Now, can you uh, hear me well now? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Great thank to have you. Good. Please thank go you. ahead. So thank you very much, Anita, and thank you for inviting me today. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be part of this panel. Uh, I will do as Julie. I will not expect to equal your your foreign minister, uh, but uh, I hope uh, whatever I can uh, provide here today is useful for everybody. So um, first of all, I would like to say that I, I am, as uh, Anita has said, I do not represent the European Commission, so I do not represent the policy, and I'm not into trade. So my world is research and innovation, which is very different. And in terms of uh, cooperation, as the title of this uh, conference today says, so for us, it's not so much conflict, it's more based on cooperation. And that's the, the late motif of the whole programs of um, research and innovation of the European Commission in which we participate. So I here uh, represent the association Aspire, which gathers 10 sectors of the European process industry. So it gathers chemical sector, it gathers steel, non ferros uh, refinery, cement, glass, and, sec uh, and other alike sectors. Um, and then I represent their view rather than the commission's view, and that's very important. Uh, for me to point out from the very beginning. So I'm going to introduce uh, the points of the European Green Deal, but from our perspective. So what is the European Green Deal in case, uh, I'm pretty sure many of you know, and, and those who don't know have heard about it. So this is the Europeans, the European Union's response to the climate and environmental challenges, which are considered as this generation's defining task. So it's pretty much aligned with, with which uh, Julie has said at the beginning of a generation shift. So it's really a, a change, a generational change and challenge that we are facing. So it, this uh, Green Deal sets a new growth strategy for Europe to transform Europe into a fair and prosperous society, but and then to, to do also an inclusive transition so that we help people's well-being and secure a healthy planet for the generations to come. So that is the main overall um, spirit of the European Green Deal, at least on the paper. Then in practice, we will see how it works, right? And then to fulfill these, they set several uh, targets or, or several main goals. The first is to become for Europe to become the first climate neutral continent in the world by 2050. That is to reach the net zero emissions by 2050. And uh, for that, uh, the, the president von der Leyen, when she arrived, when she took office, she set a new target for 2030, which was set in alignment with Paris Agreement in 40% reduction of, of GAG emissions. And she set it, she and her cabinet, of course, set it into 50 and 55% reduction. And of, of course, it was supported by the parliament and by um the council, otherwise it would not be the target, right? And then for that, they also said to decouple the economic growth from resources use. And that means to have to achieve a, a supplying clean and affordable and secure energy, building and renovating in an energy and resource efficient way, mobilizing the industry for a clean and circular economy, or accelerating the, the shift to a sustainable and smart mobility. So you see that really they tackle very several things. But another important goal is to protect human life, animals and plants by cutting pollution. And here they said three main aspects. One is zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment, 
preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity, and then a fair, healthy and environmental food system, which is the so-called from farm to fork. These, uh, to achieve all these, they have set a battery of regulations. So they are working on a climate uh, law and an European climate pact, an energy taxation directive, the circular economy action plan, the circular plastics alliance, construction products regulations, zero po pollution action plan, et cetera, et cetera. So they have really a battery of regulations that are being reviewed uh, this year, have been or are being still reviewed this year to make the European Green Deal a, a reality. So that is uh, very important. And I would like to go back to one of the main points, and it's mobilizing the industry for a clean and circular economy. So the European Green Deal very clearly sets uh, the goal also to help companies to become the world leaders in clean products and technologies. That is, it's very important for uh, for Europe and, and, and the industry is claiming for that, uh, to create a market for climate neutral and circular products. When we develop the technologies that are needed <clears throat> to reach this ambition of the climate neutrality, for sure, the cost of the products will increase until those innovations are, are uh, th those innovations are really fully deployed, at least the cost will increase. So we need to create a market which is accessible to everybody because the, the success, the key of the success for the implementation will be uh, the cost uh, that is affordable. But then also you have seen that the, the plan is very ambitious. So uh, they really, want to include all the sectors of the economy. So they, and when we call, talk about the uh, industrial sectors, they enhance especially energy, buildings, mobility, and industry. Why? Because they are the ones who, who are the larger emitters, right? So that is uh, the reason. So 75% of the uh, European Union's uh, emissions come from the production and use of energy. 40% from energy consumption by buildings, 25% from transport, and 20% from industry. So, and this is more or less the same uh, at le uh, for the industry globally. But also it's very important that because of the consequences of climate change, and that's another important reason why this uh, um, European Green Deal is put in place, it's because of the effects as that, that this will have on the population. So uh, there are some estimations there that there will be 40% uh, less available water, that there could be half a million people exposed to river flooding each year, 2.2 uh, million people exposed to coastal inund inundation each year, and 660 million additional asylum applications in the EU at five, uh, at five uh, degree uh, temperature increase, five percent, sorry, temperature increase. So it, the numbers are, the, the estimations or the projections are very clear that if we don't tackle climate change, there's no real, uh, the, the future uh, that you were commenting about, um, the, the new Cold War, uh, could become really a reality. So the goal of the collaboration on research and innovation is to overcome these problems, and hopefully this will support us not to reach that level uh, or, or that Cold War, so to say. So why supporting the industry? Yeah, so it's very important to support the industry because they are uh, one of the largest emitters, but they are also the ones who have the solutions or the biggest solutions, the solutions at a scale that can be deployed to really uh, achieve a transition towards climate neutrality and towards uh, circularity. Of course, uh, there are other areas of society that need to be involved, that's clear, but, but it will not be feasible to reach a transition without the industry. And especially we consider it will not be feasible to reach the transition without the process industry. And this is acknowledged also by the European Green Deal. So the, the, they acknowledge the energy intensive industries as fundamental to achieve the transitions and especially three of the sectors which are still 
chemicals and cement because of their relevance in the economy, you know, the, the, their weight in the economy. But of course, uh, others are also very important. Then uh, another important message, message that I would like to give today, why uh, the process industries, uh, let me uh, give you two more points on this, is because the reduction of the CO2 emissions in the process industries, in the, in the plants, in the industrial plants, will have an immediate multiplying effect in all the value chains. So everything that happens upstream will have an impact downstream in the products that we buy uh, directly as, as customers, whether it's a car, whether it's a chair, or whether it's a skirt. It doesn't matter. Then it's also very important precisely because the process industries are uh, very strong in uh, or very intensive in the use of energy and very intensive in the use of resources uh, that they can really provide solutions. So we are convinced that we are very important to close the loops so that all industrial and municipality waste stops going to landfill and goes into the industrial system again. Of course, this does not uh, avoid us to strive also on the goal to go more eco uh, into the design of the new materials so that they, do, they don't even need to go to landfill, right? But there are a lot of materials out there that we need to recuperate into the systems so that we avoid pollution. So these are the main reasons. Then also when, when it comes to energy, uh, the energy intensive industries, of course, <clears throat> need high amounts of energy. And we strive to electrification so that we can, electrification through renewable energy, so that we can uh, really uh, become CO2 uh, free emissions. But then for that, we need all the other sectors to work together. So th that, that will not be possible if there's not enough uh, energy from renewable sources, which are available at affordable prices. But another doubt that, that uh, many people in the, in, in the industry has is, will there be enough capacity for us to produce uh, enough renewable energy to provide uh, the, the, the needed resources both for the population and for the industry. That's an important doubt that we all need to solve together. Um, then I'm saying this because uh, it's important that the European Green Deal calls for a systemic change. And uh, the process industries consider these systemic changes needed. I mean, it's impossible that it's only the industry that uh, makes the changes, even if the industries, the changes in the industry are very important. But then for the industry to be able to deliver, they need to transform themselves. And it is clear also for us that um, it takes around 25 years to transform an industry. The, in the case of the process industry, we have they, our industries have two rounds of investments from now to 2050. So they, the, 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 the support needs to come now, the collaboration uh, needs to come now, and the innovations need to come quite quickly so that we can really reach the goals. And... Uh, According to, for example, our roadmap, we have um, our association runs a partnership, which is now called Aspire, but it will, it will turn into processes for planet in the next period under Horizon Europe. I'm not going to explain our roadmap today because I'm already portraying this tomorrow into the PROSIN conference, so I don't think, I, I wouldn't like to repeat too much, but it's important to realize that we have established a roadmap of research and innovation needed to transform the process industry from now to 2050. And the uh, amount of money needed, identified or estimated as needed in the next decades is of 33 billion only in research and innovation. But then this research and innovation only generates a, a change in economy uh, and growth in economy and jobs for population if it's deployed. And then here, the, the, the industries, the process industries estimate at least trillions could be needed to really deploy 
the innovations and reach this bold transition. So we consider it's very important and very fundamental that uh, there are uh, investments mobilized and the investments are de-risked. That's the only way to mobilize the investments. So um, if we want to, to reach uh, the, um, the, the ambitions which have grown exponentially, the, the, the environmental ambitions have grown exponentially and the technologies to reach the climate neutrality are not either, they are not even there or they still need to be proven it's economically uh, and, um, and uh, technical feasibility. So this requires tons of investment and then uh, they need to come now. So the, we support the European Green Deal investment plan which intends to mobilize at least one trillion of investments over the course of 10 years. And that is uh, very important. And this should combine uh, European funds. So they want 25% of all European funding destined for climate measures from 2021 to 2027. This should be leveraged by InvestEU by a 30%, but then it should be leveraged then by national uh, um, funding also, but also by private funding that should be triggered, triggered by InvestEU. But also this green trans transition has a goal to not leave anybody behind. And then they have also said what, uh, what is called a just transition mechanism, which allocates an extra 100 billion euros to support the EU regions which are more effective by the transition because they depend currently on fossil fuels or carbon intensive processes and they will need extra support to be able to reach the goals and to be able to be part of the solution. Yeah, And then within Horizon Europe program, in, which is a program with which uh, we collaborate directly, it's at least 35% of the Horizon Europe budget that will be dedicated to climate neutrality and circularity. So these are very important investments. If you ask me whether this will be enough, well, we don't know. Yeah, uh, As we said, uh, 33 billion uh, are needed only for the process industries, and we are talking about uh, 1 trillion for the whole uh, of the industry and society. So it's important, but let's see. Yeah, But uh, it's very important that everybody collaborates on that. Then another very important point for the Green Deal. Uh, it says Angels, we'll have clearly, to cut short. So if you could just yeah. wrap up in about 15 seconds. Okay, so let me just finish with one more message, which is that CO2 has no borders. So it's not only the European Commission or, or the European Union that can do this. So it needs to work with the rest of the countries. So here we see uh, much room for collaboration with other countries like USA or China. Uh, and this is very important and it can be drawn through Horizon programs, for example. I, I had uh, several data on this, but it, since I don't have time, uh, I think maybe uh, if somebody wants to have further information, uh, then I can provide it afterwards. Thank you, Angels. Thank you so much for your detailed uh, presentation. We have a quick question for you uh, from our online audience. With your base in Brussels, you are able to observe the politics around the European Green Deal. How would you describe the politics around it leading up to the launch and after? Is there a great consensus on it? Basically, where are the divisions, if any? What themes are contentious, if any? 30 seconds, please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's more a question for the European Commission than from myself. <laughs> um, what we see is not so much politics, but policy, you see, which is uh, a bit different. Is there consensus? I think there is a consensus among, um, yeah, well, not among all member states. Some member states do not have a consensus on that. And certainly the industry considers it's very important, uh, but also, um, is it feasible to reach those goals? This is to be seen, huh? It's not so easy. 
So please stay on now because we do have the panel discussion and there might be some question for you then. Uh, so just be there for us. Thank you. And very happy to mention that we have two very, very illustrious uh, panelists joining us. So we have Lee Monica Stubholt, who is uh, an excellent lawyer and a former uh, deputy minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as the Ministry of Energy and Petroleum. And we have Rolf Rupstad, who is the CEO of GARD, which is, uh, world, which is the world's largest specialized marine insurance group. Wow. So, Lee um, uh, Monica, if I could ask you the more geopolitical aspect of, you know, all the things that were said today, what strikes you the most and in what way could you relate the impact of this to Arctic, the region close to us? So I think it's a very good question because I think the rift between the US and China, whether it's widening or whether it will be managed, will change the balance for how Norway manages our strategic interests. And of course, for Norway, everyone agrees across the board that the Arctic is a, and perhaps the, most important strategic interest for us. And I can see that we should perhaps revisit our focus on the high north and to look at those um, harmonious, peaceful arenas where we can make a difference. And re remember, Anita, that the Arctic Council is one of the few remaining international theaters of conversation, as it were, where both the US, Russia, and Canada can sit down and talk amicably. Rolf, I just want to check with you on this trade issue, just focusing, uh, going away from geopolitics to trade. Um, you know, when it comes to fights, there are usually two routes. One, which is uh, what President Donald Trump is taking, which is, uh, you know, trade tariffs, sanctions, bans, boycotts, TikTok, WeChat, you know, that's one route, which people say is often too much, too soon heavy-handed. On the other side, you could do it as um, scrutiny, safeguards, uh, so that you can, you know, weed out the problems that you have, say, with Chinese surveillance or data theft or privacy. And, you know, that is often described as the light touch, but there are people who say that is too little, too late right now. What would be your assessment of the situation? What is the best route to take? Uh, to go back to what, uh, what Andreas said uh, uh, in the start of his presentation, I think there is no doubt that uh, global trade is here to stay. Uh, mm. for, for decades we have had international connections, and particularly since the Second World War, the development has been uh, steeply going in, in one direction to the benefit for the society, for people and, and, and business. And there has been some bumps on the road, and I think the bump we're in now is definitely the most serious bump we have seen since the Second World War. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that has to be overcome. But w what, what makes up this bump? And I think uh, uh, one major factor is, is what you touched upon, the, the more politicized uh, world. There are sanctions, regulations put on uh, people, and not at least on, on, on business, which is very challenging. We, as a, as a business, have to comply with, uh, with those uh, new rules. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the challenge is that quite often there are different rules, whether you deal with uh, the US, you deal with China, uh, and, and there are different regulations. But we have to comply with it, and we will play within those rules which are there any moment in time. So I think we, we will continue to, uh, to cooperate with our friends, whether it is in, in the US or, uh, or China within those rules which, which are there any, any moment in time. And, and in, it will continue in a positive direction long term. And then the question is really, will the bump be uh, short or, uh, or, or long? That's, that's really the, the question as, uh, as I see it. Um, you know, Lee, Monica, you are an energy expert, and you know they always say that trade left to business people would be fine, the world would be a happy place, but that's not how it works. Very often politics intrudes on this, and we have today foreign policy intruding and used as an instrument of uh, war or you know, um, against uh, the economic sphere. So what do you see the impact of this, of foreign policy interventions that um, actually impact upon trade and globalization? Well, I see that business is very much impacted by geopolitical differences and maybe too much from time to time. The combination 
of a weakening international free trade focus and the weakening of WTO in combination with an increasing number of sanctions and trade restriction is actually not a victimless crime, as somebody would say, but it's actually somebody paying. And for politicians, it may seem cost-free because it doesn't require anything from the budget to introduce sanctions. But for a business, it is a disruption of long-term investments and future business opportunities. So I understand that trade restriction from a business point of view is very painful. And I think that it should be recognized two aspects. Firstly, that business pays the price for foreign policy in this type of regime. And secondly, that sometimes politics can learn from business. We're pragmatic in the business community. We work with countries even though we don't agree with them about everything. And I think in that US-China rift world, I think both business and Norway and the Western countries would benefit from maybe realign our um, conversations to look at, should we look again? And who do we, uh, what are our alliances? Should we revisit, for instance, the um, list of conversations that the excellent Minister of Foreign Affairs has from all her and their meetings mm -hmm. to enter the Security Council and see are there new friends we should intensify with? Intended energy producers, the Gulf, um, the EU in a new way, as was said earlier. I think we need to make more friends and not fewer friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, ju just a comment uh, regarding the, the regulatory uh, rules, and, and I think Andreas had a very important point uh, raised as well, that uh, we need uh, common rules. And I think um, uh, it's not 100% necessary to have exactly the same rules globally in every place, but I think it's important that we have rules which, which take us somewhere in the same direction. And just a practical example from the, from the maritime industry, where we, some 40 years back, had uh, mar marine pollutions, oil pollution from, from ships, mm -hmm. uh, from tankers, as, the, as a major environmental threat. And um, uh, there was not common rules between US, Asia, uh, and Europe. Uh, IMO had uh, their uh, regulations, which was not adapted by US and, and certain other key countries in, in Asia. And, and what, uh, what did happen? At least there was some set of rules which took us to a common goal to reduce pollution. And even if the rules were not the same, the industry managed to reduce, together with authorities, class societies, oil companies, ship owners, charters, together uh, the industry was able to reduce pollution significantly. The last 10 years, the average pollution from tankers is only 3% of what it was 40 years ago. 3%. So this is an example that, yes, we managed to make a big improvement for society with different rules in different parts of the world, but at least the rules pulled us in roughly the same direction. All this uh, unpredictability, uncertainty must be good for insurance business, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's always challenges, good and bad. <laughs> uh, we have some questions from room two, so we will go across to room two. Uh, are you there, uh, Helena? <laughs> yes, we are here now. Thank you. Um, uh, we have one question here from uh, Torbjörn Rockstad from McGregor. Yeah. Well, I'm representing an uh, industry which is in the transition from the oil and gas and hopefully moving into the renewable sector. Uh, and, and we see uh, maybe uh, especially into maybe an offshore wind where we can we think we can contribute. And uh, this Paris Agreement, it's, it's going to be renegotiated in Glasgow next year, I think. And I have a question to, to, to Angel, actually. And to your knowledge, and, and how ambitious will the European Union be? And, and uh, how dedicated will it be when you take up this issue again? I don't understand whether it's, it's a question for Andreas or for me. That was for you, Angels. It, it okay, was about uh, the Paris Agreement. And, <laughs> okay, uh, great. Mm. Uh, I can tell you the level of ambition is really very high. So the Commission is uh, pushing us uh, very strongly at the process industries to really commit in our roadmap to um, the, the develop the technologies to, to match a 100% reduction of the CO2 emissions by 2050. 
and more than 50-55% reduction by 2030. So they are really pushing very strongly on that. Uh, and the level of ambition is not going to get down because uh, this is really uh, a very key point of, of the new uh, president's uh, uh, agenda. So it's not going to go down. Uh, the, the question is how to reach there. Yeah. So uh, what we are saying, for example, is that if we if they expect that we will get reach there with a single technology, um, they will be deceived. Um, all our industries agree that it, we need different types of innovations that together will be able to de to deliver the 100 uh, percent. But a single technology, no. So maybe one technology will deliver 30%, another one 60, another one 40. And the combination of all these technologies is what can deliver a new type of plant, of industrial plant, or a, and a new type of model or units without, within industrial plants. And this uh, stands the same for the processes of refining industry, for example. Uh, uh, we are talking about the process, uh, the industrial process. We are not talking about innovations in relation to the, the specific products of our 10 sectors, uh, but about innovations in relation to the industrial process, which is a different thing. But yeah, the level of ambition is not going to go down. Thank you, Angels. Um, Helena, do you have more questions? No, it was just a, a comment from my side because you're, of course, focusing on the process industry, but you also mentioned the, the, the need for, for uh, energy, which is uh, highly sure. also uh, uh, industry here in Norway where we can contribute to the EU's ambition. Hmm. For sure. Um, it's, it's a very important point for us and it's very much enhanced in our, in our roadmap that we really need uh, the, the, the source of energy to be available at affordable prices. And then here we know that the energy, the different areas of energy sector as, uh, are uh, developing innovations. The question is, when will a bulk amount of renewable energy be available? And we, are, we will be very happy to have conversations with uh, people from energy sector in, in Norway. An important point, for example, in our roadmap are the hubs for circularity, which will intend, which will have more a regional focus to develop solutions for a specific site or a specific area uh, that can later be exported to other areas in Europe or globally. I said before that CO2 has no borders, so emissions are there. It, they, they don't care if they go, they move to from Italy to Germany or from Europe to Russia or to China. They don't care about this. Uh, the, the, the borders are only political, right? So the collaboration with all the countries is very important because um, right now the emissions globally, so Europe has decreased the emissions by 20%, but uh, globally the emissions have grown 60%. Uh, so, uh, there are countries which are increasing their levels of emissions and, and then one of the requests we have, for example, from the Horizon Europe, from the European Commission, is that in our roadmap we need to settle that the innovations that we will develop here, supported by Horizon Europe or by InvestEU, they will late, later be exported to other countries abroad. Thank you, Angels. Um, I, I think we have to leave it there. We have a couple of uh, more inter interventions. Rolf, yes, please go ahead. Ju just a quick uh, comment to that. Uh, I think uh, in the situation we are now, companies which are in the forefront, forward-leaning, early adapters and developers will benefit more than, more than ever before. And I think, uh, com representing the maritime industry, uh, I think uh, when we talk about uh, scarcity of resources and energy, uh, as a society, we should be, move more of energy production, food production, and transportation to the oceans. It uh, takes less energy, and it's uh, definitely helping us also reaching our, uh, our cl uh, climate emission goals. So, uh, and, and renewable energy, I think, you know, it, it, it is coming. Yeah. Just as an example from, from our company, three years ago, renewable energy was a negligible part of our portfolio. Today, 25% of our income on the energy side is from 
renewables. So, you know, this is changing I'm as sure we speak. Angels will be happy to hear that because she was talking about all the need for renewable energy and it's you changing. can feel, you know, uh, it's perfect. Uh, just before I come to you, Liv Monica, is there any question from the audience? Any questions? Yes, please. question for, for Andreas. Uh, first, I have to say it was a very, very inspiring speech, so thank you very much. And um, you talked about global trade, and can you collaborate further on the, on the key trends in global trends, uh, in global trade? And are there any specific implications when it comes to um, transportation of minerals and the processing industry? And are there any specific implications when it comes to oil and gas? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, there is this duality, which is we want global trade because of all the benefits that I talked about. But we also have to be concerned about the climate impact. And I think some of this will be self-solving because you see what's happening with demand for um, for fossil fuels. You see what's happening with financeability of coal projects. And you will naturally see declining trade in these sectors while there might be a pickup in, in other areas. Um, I mean, just to give you, you asked for some, some statistics and trends, you know, about 20% of global emissions comes from production and distribution of traded goods. Um, uh, McKinsey is saying that local sourcing of recyclable material would reduce consumption of primary materials by 32% in 2030, 50% by 2050. These are just projections. But my point here is that I think there will be some degree of self-solving because as the world finds new solutions like renewables, you will see minerals and fossil fuels decline as a percentage of total trade, as we've seen it decline as a percentage of the total stock market, obviously. Thank you, Andreas. And last word to leave, Monica. There'll be a time out now, so the final word. So I support the concept of having the logistics, the logic of logistics will having to align with sustainability requirements. And I think we will get a post-pandemic world, not only with new pandemics, but that we have, where we have learned something about making more robust supply lines. So I believe global trade will grow, but we will see more local sourcing for the simple reason that it makes sense, it meets sustainability requirements and it makes us more robust with regard to particularly food and energy security. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I had so many questions for you, Andreas, and for Angels, but there is no time, unfortunately. It just shows that it went really fast. Uh, that's always a good sign. But uh, thank you all so much. I just wanted to say a couple of words. You know, the foreign minister said that uh, we cannot, the only thing that we cannot predict is the future. And of course, she is right, as always. Uh, the, we don't know the future, but we do know the past. Past empires have all one thing in common, they have all disappeared. Usually destroyed by war or disease. Disease, pandemic, we already have. War, we don't want. The past as well as the present teaches us that cooperation is the only way to lead to lasting achievement. Sustainable, the only sustainable way to the future is by cooperation. And we just hope the elephants are listening. But thank you all for listening. And thank you all for being such a wonderful audience, uh, for being so thoughtful and attentive. And uh, thank you very much to the sponsors for holding Global Outlook, uh, despite all the difficulties. You know that saying, when the going gets tough, Global Outlook gets going. <laughs> thank you all for being here. And uh, please come back next year for Global Outlook, the eighth edition. Thank you.